go over. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord and Father, we just say thank you for the opportunity that you place before us each day to serve. We ask that you would continue to be with us as we try to represent you being your hands and feet here on earth. And we say thank you for the opportunity again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, we will see you later. I'm going to turn things back over to Miss Winnell, and I think she'll be uh, uh, taking the helm. Go ahead, Miss Winnell. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone as well, and we're glad you're here. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Colette because she will introduce our um, pre pre presenter today. Thank you, Annelle. It is so good to have each of you here, and I want to add my welcome to you. You do have your, this, this is the Adventist Community Services Webinar Ministry Boards 101, and I want to make sure you know you have met the director, Derek Lee, already. Winnell Stevens is our assistant director, and Rebby Isaacs, also in the matching green ACS shirt, is our administrative professional. I am Colette Neuer, the Associate Director for Adventist Community Services here at the North American Division. So this is your North American Division team and we are here to serve you and uh, want to make sure as we go through this women, webinar that you know who you can contact there in the chat and ask any questions that you have. Um, as I said, we are here for Ministry Boards 101. Now, a lot of us have spent a fair amount of time in board meetings, but with varying results. They are often considered boring and unproductive to the point where I have had some just cancel them saying that they're useless. However, some of us believe that the solution is not to stop having meetings, but to do them better. So boards exist for a reason, and when they're done well, they can increase the organization's ability to perform. But um, judging from your comments on the registration survey, that has not been your experience overall. So thank you for persevering and joining us today. We are here to tell you that there is hope. There is hope. Uh, Elder Doolin is our presenter today. He has an abundance of experience both sitting on boards and committees as well as chairing them. And he has done this for both the community organizations as well as multiple church organizations. Currently, he is serving as the vice president for regional ministries and outreach ministries and human relations at the North Pacific Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And under outreach ministries, he gives oversight to Adventist community services, disaster response, prison ministry, and urban ministries. So you can see why he has a lot of experience on boards and committees. Uh, prior to this, I worked with Elder Doolin in the Washington Conference, where he served as director of outreach ministries, which consisted of community services, personal ministries, prison ministries, and regional affairs. So I can personally vouch for his qualifications to teach this class. His service for the church has included college administrator, pastor, church planter, church departmental leader, and union officer. And in his role as ministry organizer and meeting planner, Pastor Doolin is always looking, always looking for opportunities to bring leaders together for mutual education, inspiration, and united action. And that is why we are here today. Pastor Doolin is happily married to Linda Doolin, who is a licensed family therapist. And they are proud parents of, of Adina Doolin Wright and Adi Allison Doolin Francis. And they have six grandchildren. So that is a collection in many books. So you've got a good, good group. Uh, questions, just to let you know before I turn the time over, questions will be taken at the end of the presentation through the chat. So please enter them into the chat as we go and Rebby will facilitate asking them when, when the main presentation is done. And today's re presentation will also be recorded so it'll be made available on the ACS website and we'll put that link into the chat for you. So when it goes up, you can find it there. We'll, sh we'll tell you where to find that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn our time over to Elder Doolin. 
Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you, Colette and Derek uh, for the invitation, Winnell, Rebby, uh, all of you for the invitation and those of you who have responded to the survey. Uh, I will get to the survey right at the end of our presentation, but there's a lot to go over. What uh, my agenda has for today is to go as fast as I can through just the basic areas that I want to present and then turn it over to you guys uh, to, for questions and comments. And uh, as I go along, you can put your uh, questions and comments in the chat. And at the end, uh, Rebby or Winnell or someone uh, will lead us through um, a discussion of those things. So we're going to get right going. I, I listening to the um, introduction, I was wondering who who Colette <laughs> was introducing, and uh, I was thinking that you know, with all of the experience, and I have had a long experience. At, in fact, I was thinking, um, Colette, that um, my first uh, I organized my first nonprofit in Oakland, California, uh, at the age of twenty. Um, a community nonprofit. So uh, I've been in the war, got a lot of scars, and um, you might think that uh, I know everything there is to know about uh, boards, but you'd be wrong. Um, I am learning every day, every time I'm involved in another committee or board, just how much I do not know, and realizing that everything changes. Uh, it's changing every day, every moment. Um, this whole thing of, um, of governance is changing um, right before our eyes. So we're going to get into some basics today because this is 101. And um, you, you, you made some comments um, uh, in the survey, and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. But uh, what I have done is go through and just list some of the regular complaints um, that we get about boards. So what's wrong with boards? Poor meeting attendance, committees that aren't effective, uh, everybody's not involved, um, just finding good board members to join is, is a problem. Board, member, board meetings are not engaging. Uh, it's not even clear what the board does. Uh, the board doesn't feel connected to the work of the organization. The organization is doing certain things. The board is not even engaged with that. Board doesn't have current information on the trends of the field that they're in and no succession planning or leadership development. The Urban Institute research uh, came up with a number of major uh, problems and issues that boards face. Uh, low board committee attendance. I have been to so many boards, and especially if you are a pastor, and at least there were four or five pastors who, uh, who uh, filled out the survey, uh, just getting people to the board meeting is just really, really difficult. Low participation when they are there. Um, poor meeting management is a part of the equation. Poor communication between the executive director and board chair, and then members feeling removed from what's going on. Poor communication with the stakeholders and the funders, and of course, focus on the operational, not the strategic. And I, we could spend just uh, an hour just on this slide right here, but the last one, focus on operational, uh, not strategic. Um, this is seeing the, um, uh, missing the forest by looking at the trees. Um, and, and oftentimes we're just focused on one little particular thing and we're not really seeing the overall uh, issues that the organization is facing or what's happening outside the organization that impacts the organization. And so we're just uh, basically uh, what I call uh, navel gazers. Uh, we're just uh, looking at ourselves and we're just concerned. And, and, and much of this, and I, 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 I am not pitching this toward churches, but I will say something about churches right at this point. 
most churches are just concerned with what's happening inside the four walls of the church. But that's not the calling of the church. The calling of the church is to go out, outside of the four walls and context of the church. And we'll get to the next slide. Um, more, most bo boards focus on the financial inside, uh, oversight, uh, setting organizational policy, and evaluating the executive director. But uh, uh, better boards focus on a wider uh, uh, number of issues whether the organization is accomplishing the mission. Um, this is another one that we could spend the rest of the hour on. <laughs> we're just doing stuff. We're doing stuff. And we're so busy doing stuff, we really don't evaluate whether the mission is being accomplished. You know, uh, if we're feeding people, um, okay, we've given all the food away, but is hunger going away? Are there other factors that deal with hunger uh, that we should be paying attention to and addressing? Uh, maybe we should be collaborating with other organizations who could be involved to make a dent or a difference in what's going on. Uh, fundraising, that's one that we really find difficulty with many nonprofit organizations. People sit on boards, but they don't contribute. Um, and we'll get to that in just a moment monitoring programs and services, community relations. And this one is a pet peeve of mine, evaluating our own performance. When have you been on a board where that the board has evaluated themselves with regard to their own performance? Wow, we need to do that to know how we're doing. Well, let's drop back, and since this is Boards 101, let's drop back and talk about what is a board and why is a board. So uh, these next two slides will give us a little bit on that. A board of directors is the governing body, and I'm going to have to move this on my screen. I don't know if you guys can see this. Yeah, there we go. A board of directors is the governing body of a nonprofit, governing body. Directors are responsible for overseeing the organization's activities, but not managing them. Mm. Governance is high level strategy, oversight, accountability. Management is the day-to-day -day operations of a nonprofit. So you have the overall strategy, the umbrella strategy oversight, and then within that is the management of the day-to-day -day operations of the nonprofit. Why are boards needed? Private companies and governmental entities can't fulfill the services that the general public needs. And that's why the government has created a structure that provides tax exemptions for nonprofit organizations. So the nonprofit structure is designed so that the boards are responsible for managing public donations responsibly and don't take advantage of not paying taxes. Even with the church, you realize that most churches don't pay taxes. <laughs> they're tax exempt and their property is not taxed. And so there are some responsibilities that accrue to us. Um, even uh, most nonprofits, in fact, all nonprofits, I believe, um, uh, have to do articles of incorporation with the state. And then in order to be nonprofit or to get the nonprofit status, they have to apply to the IRS um, uh, to receive that. Now, there are three basic duties of a, of a board membership, and uh, protecting the organization from legal action is one, promoting safe and ethical working environment, and then safeguarding the organization's integrity. Those of you who have studied uh, <clears throat> board management, you know that we, uh, we discuss it in a little different way. The, there are three duties. The duty of care. The, what is the duty of care? Board members must <clears throat> use the same level of care 
that an ordinary prudent person, and we could really uh, uh, underline ordinary prudent person and who that is and what that is. I don't know, maybe it's changing, uh, but an ordinary prudent person, this is what the law says, would exercise in a, in a like situation or circumstance. What would a normal person do? That's the first thing about the duty of care. What would a normal person do? Then the second is the duty of loyalty. Board members must give undivided allegiance. Boy, I like that. That's strong. Undivided allegiance to the organization when making decisions affecting the organization. Board members cannot put personal interests above the interests of the organization. And then real or perceived conflicts of interest should be disclosed. I would say that this one duty of loyalty is one of the major problems that we have in boards. And most board members don't understand it. Undivided allegiance to the organization. So when you sit on a nonprofit board, you are not representing the people who sent you. You are representing the, pe the people that are in the room and the organization that is in the room. You're representing that organization. If it's a food bank, uh, housing, uh, association, whatever it is, you are representing the best interests of that organization. I'll let that sink in. Maybe we'll get some questions on that at the end, but that's very important, the duty of loyalty. And then there's the duty of obedience. Board members have a duty to ensure that the organization remains obedient to its central purposes. This means to keep the main thing the main thing. And this is described in the Articles of Incorporation or in the bylaws or other governing documents, such as a formal mission statement. So the, the duty of obedience means that this is what this organization is standing for. This is what it was purposed for. And we're going to stay with that purpose. Now, if we're going to change that purpose, then we probably need to start another organization. Okay. But as long as we're in this organization with these um, articles and these purposes, we're going to stay there and, 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 and fulfill that particular formal mission. Board members are free to exercise reasonable judgment regarding how the organization should best fulfill its mission. So how the mission is rolled out, that's uh, up to the board and up to members to contribute to, but the obedience, the duty of obedience is we're going to stay within um, what was the founding and governing documents of the organization. Of course, the governing documents can be changed, but uh, whatever it is, we're going to stay within those guidelines and within those lanes. That's the duty of obedience. Let's go right to the responsibilities of a board member and um, board source, as well as other uh, organizations that uh, excel in training for uh, board members. Um, this is their list, um, which I've um, uh, cut down so that we can uh, fit it into this particular uh, presentation. In fact, this one, these next three slides is a whole presentation that I have done. And um, it's very, it's uh, much more than what you see here. But the, the first thing is to attend meetings. Um, I know all of you are muted, but I hope somebody's raising their hand and saying, amen. Uh, attend meeting. How many board members don't attend the meeting? Boy, it's real quiet in the church. Uh, <laughs> they, they, I mean, you can't be a board member and you don't come to the meeting. Preach it. Problem. <laughs> okay, I did get one preach. All right, good. Um, it's number two, prepare for meetings. Now, this is that we're gonna really get into the weeds down at the end of this because this is hit many times by the reactions that you guys uh, did to the survey. Uh, how can you prepare for a meeting and the agenda isn't there? 
There's no agenda for the meeting. It's not sent out before. There's no previous minutes. How can you prepare for the meeting? Um, submit agenda items in advance. Um, uh, I've been in many, many committees that uh, and, and, and boards where that you get to the meeting, with, either there's no agenda or everybody has agenda items that they want to put on the agenda, but nobody knew about the other ones. And so we're ill prepared to actually have the discussion. Number three, know the organization, its mission, its goals, its policies, its programs, its services, its strengths, its needs. There's a lot of things that, that a board member needs to know in order to interact during the board meeting, as well as afterwards. And number four, serve on committees and task force. And this is a decision that the board must make. Um, there's the executive committee, there may be a membership committee, a finance committee, a program committee, a resource committee, and many other committees. And um, board members serve on these committees as they are invited uh, to do so by the board. Make financial contributions. If you're on a nonprofit board. Um, it's just a cardinal rule. Uh, even if it's a dollar, <laughs> even if it's just a dollar a year, because often when boards are writing grants and whatever, the grant the, the grantors are going to ask, you know, have your board members contributed? <laughs> Uh, they may not ask how much uh, they individually have contributed, but they will ask, um, have they contributed to this? And if the answer is no, or to what percentage, usually they're asking what percentage of your board members, and they want to hear that 100% of the board members have contributed financially. Um, they want to know who, uh, uh, that the board members have skin in the game, okay, if you're asking them to give support. And then um, promote the organization. <laughs> this one really gets sticky because there are board members who talk very badly about the organization, which they are a member of the board. Now, you know, if it's a private conversation, they have frustrations. That's one thing. But, you know, public scorn of their own organization, which they represent. Um, really means that they don't really understand the responsibility of being a board member. Um, and then uh, recruiting new board members is a responsibility of board members. Um, let's go down through the end. This is our last slide on this. Keep up with the trends. And this is relating to the organization's field of interest or the target group that they're serving. Um, if you're serving a homeless people, then you need to learn about homeless people. Who are they? Why are they homeless? Um, what are the issues that they face? Other than, let's say, you know, eating a sandwich uh, once a, a week that you take downtown and feed people under the bridge. Uh, you know, do, will that one sandwich hold them for the next week? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there are there other needs that they have. What are the trends? Uh, and then support the executive director. This is very important. Um, if you don't like the executive director and they aren't doing well, then you need to change them. But whoever is the executive director, they need the support of the board members. Maintain confidentiality. Mm, I won't even say anything about that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've had so many experiences that as soon as the board meeting is over, uh, I'm getting calls from people not on the board in another state asking <laughs> about what happened in the, and telling me what was told in the board meeting. And especially mm. with cell phones and whatever, um, it's almost, uh, this, is, this rule is, is just abrogated all the time. Maintain confidentiality. That's still a responsibility of board members. And then serve the whole. Rather than any special interest group, you're serving the whole of the organization and supporting what that organization is doing. And lastly, avoid conflicts of interest. And we'll talk about that later. And so this slide just says a responsible board member can make a huge impact. 
And that's really what uh, I think each of you want to do as a responsible board member. Let's talk a bit about the uh, concepts beyond uh, or behind um, uh, uh, board work uh, and governance. Um, and this idea, and we could spend another hour on this, just performance versus purpose. And, and the, 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 the note says, problem with boards is not just performance, that they aren't, aren't performing well, but rather a problem of purpose. What is our purpose being here? What are we doing? Governing work needs to be meaningful to the organization's mission and work. And oftentimes that gets um, sidetracked. Um, the, 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 the actual workers are out doing stuff and the people on the board are disconnected from that mission and from that work. So here are some governance uh, dimensions that we must consider. First, what is the mission? What is the mission of the nonprofit organization? Who is the constituency of this organization? What is the developmental stage of the organization? In a few moments, I'm going to, and I might as well introduce it now. Uh, in my mind, um, I was thinking about uh, stages of, of the organization and, and I, 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 I made a mental note in my mind uh, of an analogy with baseball. And I'm very familiar with baseball. I just play baseball. And you have a baseball field. You have, you know how it's laid out. You know, you've got a home base and you've got first base, second base, third base. And, you know, where is your organization on uh, getting moving forward um, um, along the bases? And then I realized, well, wait a minute. If this is a professional ball uh, team or game, uh, there's some people in the stands. There are some fans, uh, actually fans mean fanatics. Uh, there are some fanatics that aren't even on the, on the, the, the field or whatever, uh, but they're in the stands and they're either uh, applauding or booing or standing up or whatever they're doing, but they're, they may have some effect on the game. If you're a Seahawks football fan, you, you know about the 12th man. So they, you know, they're, they're there. And then there are people down on the field, uh, but they're in the dugout. They're not on the field. Um, they may do some encouragement or whatever to the team members who are out there on the field or going up to bat or whatever. They give some counsel, um, but they're not on the field. They can't score in the dugout. <laughs> they can't move from bases uh, and grow and develop uh, there. And then, you go, of course, you have the guy in the batter's box. Uh, he's got to hit the ball or, or walk. <laughs> but he's got to get on base. And then once he gets on first base, how does he move forward? Is first base enough? Well, no, you can't score. You, we, don't, we don't put a score on the scoreboard if you just get to first base. Okay, so there's got to be a progression. So um, what is the developmental stage of the organization? That may tell you a lot about what, uh, uh, what needs to happen uh, next. What is the work this board needs to accomplish to meet the needs of the overall organization? And then um, continuing, uh, governance problems. Uh, some people think that one side, uh, one size fits all, it doesn't. Um, one of the problems is disconnection from the service community, uh, separation between the board and staff, and that has uh, many consequences, including uh, leading to lack of knowledge, disengagement, as well as distrust, separation between the board and the staff. And then of course, we've already talked about navel gazing, inward focus, where that uh, this is a, a real problem because the reason the, the board is there is to be somewhat of a bridge between the activities of the organization and the overall community. And then of course, uh, loss accountability. So uh, what ideas do we have for revitalizing board governance? 
And here are some ideas that I have called from a variety of sources. There's no one right model or approach. Uh, governance, and, and this one, you got to get this. I don't know. Uh, I don't know even how to state this any better. But governance is a function and a process. Okay, we're doing stuff. But boards, well, governance is the overall, I'm sorry. Boards are a structure or the structure. It may not be the only structure. And that's why the second, uh, the third thing there, governance does not need to be solely located in the structure of the board. So governance is the overall, the large, the, 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 the forest. Governance is the forest. Uh, boards may be some trees <laughs> that are within the forest, but there's a lot of other things in the forest that we want to deal with. Um, secondly, go uh, governance that is community-centric versus organization-centric. And from your comments uh, to, the, um, to the survey, I know that some of you uh, really, this really uh, uh, is a burr under your saddle is that uh, the organization is just, we're just dealing with ourselves. We're just having potlucks for ourselves. We're just, it's all internal. And we're really not, we say we're here for the community, but we're really not doing much uh, community transformation work. We're not even focused on the community. Governance should be built upon principles of participatory democracy participatory democracy. So uh, you want to hear, you want to make the, the, the table as large as you can, get as many people as you uh, can reasonably uh, hear um, through the board, maybe not at the board meeting, uh, but through the board, you want to hear as many people and as many viewpoints of life uh, or, or, uh, or opinions uh, as you possibly can. Shared governance uh, is also uh, a part of that, redistributing the power, redistributing the decision making. Now, this is the part that I like, and I uh, brought this in from another presentation that I make, and it's a full presentation, so I'll just give you a couple things. But as far as I'm concerned, the whole matter boils down to people. That's it. Governance is about people, managing people, uh, encouraging people, leading people, um, recruiting people. And that's where we start uh, right there, recruiting the right people. I have near me the book um, by most of you have Jim Collins's book, uh, Good to Great. And uh, Jim talks about uh, getting the right people on the bus and getting them in the right seats on the bus. Oftentimes, we just have the wrong people on the bus. <laughs> and they're definitely not in the right seat. Uh, getting people who have predetermined and needed skills. It is predetermined skills. You know what skills these people have and they are needed on the board providing proper orientation and training when new members join the board, and then having a consistent and systematic recruitment process based on the organization's changing needs. Oftentimes we think that once a person is on the board, they should be there forever. There should be board terms. If you want to re-elect them after three years, you can do that. But there ought to be terms where that they serve for a certain thing and then there's a reevaluation. It gives you an opportunity to change uh, members on the board. This is peopling the board. How do we do that? <clears throat> well, you start with defining what you need. What skills, what qualities are needed? Um, <clears throat> I even encourage, and it's, it's often difficult to get boards to do this, but conduct a skill and quality assessment of the current leaders. And in fact, the reason why the board is the, where it is, if it's good or if it's bad, is because of the members of the current board. So if the board is not doing well, 
you need to evaluate the board that you currently have to understand why it's not doing well and what needs or holes there are that need to be filled by new members coming into the board. That may mean you have to enlarge the board, or it may mean having some difficult conversations with members of the board, letting them know that you appreciate their service for the last 20 years, but you're asking them to be members emeritus of the board <laughs> or on a uh, advisory committee or whatever, uh, but that uh, their gifts and their skills um, uh, are no longer needed at this point in the board. Where are your gaps? Understanding where the gaps are. And this will serve as a starting point for recruitment of new members. <clears throat> and then uh, I, I advocate, and it is advocated all over, to have an interview process. And I know this, <laughs> this really doesn't make a sen any sense to most churches. Certainly, if you're, if you're dealing, coming from a church board the standpoint, you have a nominating committee, but uh, the nominating committee doesn't interview anybody, um, and maybe they should. But after determining the needed skills, then write a board member job description. Seek several ad, ad, uh, applicants for the position. Give uh, applicants board information, uh, maybe in a packet or whatever, that they can evaluate and make an informed decision. Uh, and in my experience as a pastor with, um, with many uh, church officers and, and, and members, uh, often people are asked to do jobs that they don't even understand. <laughs> and even the people that ask them to do it don't understand it either. Um, and so write something out. Um, and of course, with the, with, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have plenty of, of data and information that you can share with people before they accept a position. But have, have the applicants fill out a skills inventory. If you know that your board needs certain skills, then find people with those skills or, or in, in individuals that you think have those skills, have them write it out. Then you may find out they don't have the skills you think they have. The governance committee then could review those skills and those needs and arrange for interviews. Let's talk just a little bit about diversity in boards. And this is extremely important, but, but difficult Nick, for some individuals. Um, here's some of the uh, uh, areas of diversity, age, gender, ethnicity, resources, community connections, especially if you're a nonprofit organization trying to make transformation in the community, you need to have some people with community connections. Now, the problem with that is, is that many church organizations are so internally focused that we really have very few members who have community connections. That may mean you might need to consider individuals who are not members of your current congregation or denomination in order to have community connection. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know whose foot I stepped on. Um, excuse me, but that's the reality. And then there are personal qualities you want to consider, uh, areas of expertise, obviously, uh, personal style, need to be considered as well as their experience and their interests. This is how we set up winning boards. We, uh, winning boards need diversity um, so that they can make changes and transition as, uh, as things change in society. Um, base the selection of board members on skills, rotation of terms, interests, a commitment to support the job description that they are given or the role that they have on the board. Have each member commit, uh, complete, sorry, complete a board member agreement. This is what I understand you're asking me to do. This is what I'm willing to do. Um, an actual written agreement, signed agreement. Uh, identify 
the values each member would like to receive as a result of their service. So there is a implied contract in board membership. That is the organization is asking the board member to do this for this, uh, uh, with this result, a hope, hope for result. And then the board member is expecting to learn certain, to uh, experience certain experiences and to learn certain things as a result and to see certain results from their service. And I think that if as, as much as this is, can be outlined uh, and written down, um, it will keep everybody in their proper lane and engaged uh, in, in the board process. Uh, orientation and involvement, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Our time is running. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, have orientation for new members within one month of recruitment. Uh, ask the new member for input and feedback after orientation and after the first two meetings and immediately involve them in the appropriate committees. I'm going to move really fast now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip that one. Um, <clears throat> there's some differences. Um, uh, you don't have to do everything through the board. Uh, this slide gives some differences between board standing committees and task forces. And um, uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, but I won't. But you can see that standing committees are made of board members. Um, their broad issues, or they should be, their focus should be broad issues, their scope, uh, policy, and strategic, and they report, they're members of the board, uh, subsets of the board, they report to the board. Whereas the task force, uh, their makeup could be staff as well as others. Their focus is a specific objective, and then their scope is that program uh, implementation, and they report back to the executive committee or staff. Uh, people assigned for that responsibility. The benefits of the task force, um, rather than just making everything a board subcommittee, is that it is specific, it's short term, um, you have a lot of flexibility in terms of how to get it done, and it allows the board to determine its own substructure uh, by the work that needs to get done and not vice versa. Um, make sure that the uh, dog is, is wagging the tail and not the tail the dog. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to go to the survey respondents. And if you've got questions and whatever, please put them in the chat because we're just getting ready to do that. Uh, participants um, uh, in the survey um, uh, for this particular uh, seminar, uh, executive directors were six, board members 21, um, volunteers 10, pastors 5, uh, conference directors 4, and others 10. Here's some survey uh, responses. Does your ministry currently have a board? 27 said yes, uh, 26 no, so about evenly split. On a scale of 1 to 5, how satisfied are you with your board? Mm. One, level 1, very dissatisfied, 29. So half of this group uh, were not satisfied. Level two, uh, three, uh, that makes 32, um, not very satisfied. Level three, 11, level four, nine, and level five, four. Um, we ask, um, what would be your top three frustrations? And I have put these into two, uh, three groupings. Uh, first, board meetings. You know, a lot of comments about board meetings. Too long. No, uh, and no meeting or infrequent meetings. No participation when you have a meeting. Repetitive comments. Difficult to get consensus. No agenda. No agenda sent out prior to the meeting. Previous minutes not reviewed. By the way, uh, a, mi uh, a, a meeting without, a, uh, uh, without minutes. Um, was a conversation, but it was not a meeting, <laughs> okay? So you've got to document a uh, continuing discussion about an issue after it's already been decided. Those are the uh, meeting kinds of, uh, board meeting kinds of issues that, uh, that you mentioned. And then uh, there were uh, frustrations about board leadership and climate, uh, uh, and climate and the climate of the board. Too much secrecy. You can read them. 
things done according to personal desires rather than priorities. Propagating falsehood. Wow. Um, I like this one. Board leadership railroads others. <laughs> Ever been on a board where that, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the board, it was either his way or the highway, okay? Um, uh, I, 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 I remember um, uh, people talking about uh, uh, one, one board leader. Uh, this is a mythical board leader. His name was Dick Tate. You'll get that uh, when we're done. <laughs> and, and he had any other, other members of the family were on the board, Irritate and, and others uh, were on the board. The whole Tate family were there. You've been on boards like that. Much talk, no action, power struggles, lack of cooperation and teamwork, decisions made without discussion, major decisions made without all uh, stakeholders being involved. Wow. No time to get to know other board members. And then strategic concerns. No discussions about doing things to impact the community. No focus on the purpose, the mission. Uh, no financial support. No board members. <laughs> this was interesting. No board members with experience under the age of 65. <laughs> That's a recruitment problem, isn't it? Um, lack of communication. Resistance to modern methods of communication, no vision, no, uh, no outreach goals, spending too much time on minor things, and lack of clarity on the role of the board. All right, questions and comments. All right, thank you, Byron. We want to thank you first for, for this presentation. Just uh, I think our brains are full. But we're gonna we're gonna conjure up a couple uh, questions here. I'm gonna turn the time over to Rebby to facilitate those questions. All right. Um, our first question was sent to me directly. Uh, it is, what should one do if board doesn't do those things you listed? <laughs> uh, there, there used to be a song we used to sing. Um, um, uh, it was about the church and, and, uh, it says, um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> says, uh, we have a deacon on the board and he won't do right. What are you going to do? This is in the song. And, and the answer was, uh, take the deacon off the board, put the board on the deacon and let the church roll on. <laughs> 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 the name of the song was let the church roll on um, and and so you either you've got to educate the board or you just really need to get on another board because you're spinning your wheels and you're frustrated and this group um just showed a, a, a tremendous amount of frustration is out there with boards and and rather than saying boards don't work or the board system doesn't work. It's just that your board needs to make changes. And it may, you may do that through education. Um, that may help. Um, or, you know, personally sitting down and talking with the leadership of the board. A lot of what happens and the comments that have been made thus far have been a result of lack of good board leadership. So the leadership and education of the board chair or secretary and others on the board makes a tremendous difference. Okay, um, next question. Do you have any suggestions on how to determine the time of term limits for board members? I think the, the suggestion is, is two to three years. Uh, nonprofit boards, two to three years. It almost takes a year for them to get up to speed, okay? So mm -hmm. I, I would lean toward three, three years, maybe even four years, um, but it depends upon what kind of operation you're doing and, and how, often, how often are you changing? Uh, how often are, are your clients changing, okay? Um, because, you know, um, you know, I, I, I uh, uh, yeah, anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you speak about the duty of loyalty when you sit on multiple boards? 
especially when they have similar missions. For example, two food bank boards or board member for both the church and the school. Yeah, well, you, you just declare who you are at that particular point. And, um, and you will have to segment your thinking. Um, instead of saying, when, when an issue comes up, let's say both boards are trying to do the same thing. Uh, rather than you saying, um, I can't vote for this on this board because I voted for it on that board, you have to say, is this the best decision for this particular organization and this particular board at this time? Okay. If you can't do that, then uh, uh, say you have a conflict of interest and don't get involved in that discussion. If that makes sense. All right, next question. Where do non-church members fit into a board or committee structure? I would ask another question. Where do non-church members fit into the church at all? Non-church members are potential church members. Amen lights. <laughs> I, 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 I think that the answer to that question is, is, is out there. I mean, those are the people you really want. Um, uh, outside of the United States, pretty much uh, the fastest growing places of the Seventh-day Adventist church in the world, um, Africa, Inner America, South America, Asians, they have far more non-Adventist members involved in the church than they have Adventists. That's what Sabbath school is about. They, and that's where they win their members. They get, uh, they get people, general public people involved in some aspect of the church. Those people learn about Jesus through the members and, and relationship with the members of the church. And that's why they join. And that's why they stay, if they stay. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, how do you recruit the right people on the church board when membership is linked to positions? <laughs> That's why church boards don't function very well as nonprofit boards. So you would have to change the culture of your church and church board to make this paradigm that I'm teaching, uh, that I've just shared, really work. Um, and, and, and then let's just face it, the church board structure is based upon leaders of certain departments of the church, which most of those departments are focused upon internal structure of the church. In fact, even the use of the church building, and I'm writing an article on this, I don't know whether anybody will print it, but even the church of the, uh, the use of the church building, which is probably the biggest financial outlay of a local church, is only used a few hours a week. That makes no sense for any nonprofit or any profit business. You're going to spend millions of dollars on a structure that you only use for a couple hours. All right. Um, for an effect article, we're going to print that article, uh, Byron Doolin. I put <laughs> it in my ear, so uh, let us know when that takes place. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. There's a there's a risk taker right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question for an effective board meeting: When should the agenda and the minutes be circulated? As soon as possible. If, 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 if you can send it out a week ahead, that would be fine, but at least a day or two ahead so that people can be, uh, if they know, I, I would say have a regular practice of, okay, if it's going to be two days before, then every time send it two days before. If it's going to be a week before, every time, you know, send it a week before so that people are looking for it, okay? They're anticipating what's going on. 
I, I know that, you know, I mean, uh, you guys are at the North American division. Um, you, you can't respond to the issues going on in the division um, unless you know about it before you get in the meeting. And if you don't know about it, when you get in the meeting and know the background and whatever in history, then you're, you're mute. You know, you just, you're listening to the few other people who know what it is and you can't engage and you certainly aren't going to take the responsibility for it because you knew nothing about it. So if we really want everybody to cooperate and work together, we've got to know beforehand, hey, this is coming up. These are the backgrounds of this. Uh, if you have questions about it, call such and such. Let's have a little discussion even before we get to the meeting. Now, I know some people think, well, you know, that's campaigning. No, it's just trying to understand the issue so that when the issue comes to the table, everybody feels like they can make comments with, with, with regard to it. Derek, did you have a question? Or what that was it? Um, another question is, will the participants be able to receive a copy of this uh, Zoom meeting? Yes, this meeting is being recorded, this webinar, and we will have it posted on our website. And I see that Winnell has already um, posted our, the link to all the recordings. Uh, another question, can you address leaders limiting the length of the meeting to one hour, even if there is a lot to be discussed? Some members feel as if there is no time to comment on issues. Yeah, and, and, and another way to handle that, if you, um, well, some meetings are not, you're not going to get it done in an hour. So I think that, but, but I think that can, that discussion can happen at the prior meeting to say the next meeting, we're going to have two hours because we need enough time to discuss it. Another way to handle that is by having a subcommittee, a subcommittee of the board or a task force that actually studies uh, the situation or the issue and then brings a report. And oftentimes, if it's a major program that they're looking at or whatever, that report is preliminary. And so they study it, maybe for two months, they bring it back to the, uh, in the third month to the uh, general board, and then they take a month for additional comment. And so by the time it comes back, it's been gone over for three or four months, and then you can make a decision and people know um, you know, how they feel about it and what the ramifications are. And so that everybody uh, can vote intelligently and whatever, uh, uh, <laughs> whatever criticism that comes from the constituency or the staff as a result of the decision, everybody is prepared to handle that. Okay, we have a comment here. Board members need to study the financial report before the treasurer unveils it too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you you guys you guys are you guys are messing up the treasurer's thing. It's it's the you know it's the the rabbit in the hat. Here you see it and now you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and absolutely the the that comment is right on time. Uh, especially the financial reports. And, and, and the question is, is, is there financial education as a part of the board? Because oftentimes you get a financial sheet and everybody can't read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Amen. Amen. Oh. <laughs> they can't read it. And, and so, so they don't know how, how, what, what am I seeing? And so the treasurer or the uh, CFO or whoever needs to take time doing that. I, I remember one uh, treasurer, he used to give us, uh, after he gave the report, he, he would give us a quiz <laughs> on the financial report. And we learned how to read that through, through that process. Hey, Byron, I yes. think we are at the top of the hour. So there, there is another question, but we're going to go ahead and close. Obviously, Obviously, this could be a semester long class. I'm not even going to say an all day class because this, um, 
I think the level of frustration that many of us have felt in board meetings speaks to our lack of education on these issues. So we thank you so much for bringing some light as much as we could to the, to the issue today. I think you have stirred up a lot of thoughts and questions and realization of how we can move forward and, and the opportunities. I do see a couple more. So if you are willing, we can, we can hold on. Did you have something else to say there? Yes. No, I, I would just, just say uh, to end, um, uh, if, if we go to the principles, the basics, and I presented the basics today, if we just <laughs> marinate on those and just think on those, pray on those, work on those, a lot of these other problems will go away because um, uh, board, boards do work. We just have to work them. Very, very good words to end on. <laughs> so uh, Revy is going to have a prayer for us. And if there's some, if you're willing, Byron, to just hang by for a couple yeah, I'll more hang minutes. On. I'll hang we'll on. give people access to you for a few more minutes. And if you can back up your slide one, there was uh, a request to get a couple more notes off of that. So, Oh, slide one, the first no, slide? No, no, just, no. Just go back one. Go back one. To the last slide before this, this yes, one? I, I believe that's the one. Okay. And then I'm gonna ask Rebby to close us out with a prayer and then we'll have a little more informal chat here with our presenter. If, if, if I could, before Rebby gives prayer, um, thank you, Byron Doolin. And I know you're gonna stay after and we certainly are appreciative of that, but I think you all understand why we asked Byron Doolin to speak on this issue. He is an expert, has an expertise that uh, he has shared with us. And we are extremely appreciative, Byron, uh, for your time and the effort that you put into your presentation. Uh, as you say, let the church roll on. Uh, we are ever so appreciative of uh, what you've done for us. So uh, thank you once again. And Rebby, at that, I think you can close out with prayer. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Doolin uh, that was brought to us, Lord, um, on uh, boards. Um, and please be with us, Lord, as we grasp this information and apply it to our own church board or, or ministry board um, so that we may um, continue, we may be able to uh, continue to do your work in a more effective manner um, and also be able to communicate well with the other board members. Uh, thank you, Lord, for blessing each one of us here on this uh, Zoom call. And please be with us, Lord, in our individual roles and responsibilities as we do your ministry. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.